Hi, everybody. Uh, Michael Silber, Event Director for Inlet Australia here. Uh, today, talking to another um, leader of the industry, Andrew Dillon, who is the CEO of Energy Networks Australia. Uh, he's been the CEO of uh, ENA since uh, uh, September 2017. And prior to that, he was general manager of uh, at Ausnet Services, uh, general manager of corporate affairs at Ausnet Services. And he's been a senior ministerial advisor energy for the Victorian government. Uh, welcome, uh, Andrew. Thanks, Michael. Good to be here. Glad to have you. Yeah, I'd like to start off uh, this uh, chat with um, a little bit uh, uh, what your observations are on how the industry, how the uh, network industry has handled uh, the pandemic crisis here in Australia. Well, I think like many other industries, a lot of the corporate staff uh, and the network sector are dealing with working from home and all those challenges. Um, but in terms of the real core of the operations of our networks, in some ways it has been a little bit business as usual. And the real focus has been keeping the lights on and keeping the gas flowing throughout this crisis. Um, we have had challenges with how managing social distancing, uh, how we make sure we educate the public about the needs occasionally to turn the power off to continue to do critical works. Um, because if we don't do some of that, haven't been doing some of that work in the last two months, it's going to lead to much bigger problems down the track. Um, so there have been some of the key operational challenges, but from networks, certainly many of the of the field staff, it's been focusing on making sure uh, the critical work that has to get done uh, still had, had to get done, uh, regardless of the, of the pandemic. Um, so, so as we emerge from the pandemic and, and move forward and look to the future, um, from a kind of a bird's eye view, what are the biggest challenges facing the electricity transmission and distribution industries? Um, one of the big shortish term ones is as a result of the pandemic, there has been, you know, there's a key focus on critical works getting done. And that has meant some other work has been delayed, no doubt about that. Um, and now we are starting to emerge from the restrictions. Um, for the electricity companies, it's increasingly clear that we need to focus on what has to get done before next summer to be ready, particularly from a bushfire perspective, which is, is a focus every year. But obviously now we've had this disruption in the last few months, it's, it's going to be a big challenge uh, in, in the coming over the winter period in particular. Um, and aside from COVID itself, there is an element of uh, some of the things that were very much on our agenda three or four months ago uh, are still on the agenda and are still ongoing problems with the, with the sector. So the key challenges there are renewables integration, whether you're talking large scale solar and wind into the transmission network, or you're talking household solar and batteries uh, into the distribution grids and also for our gas members uh, continuing on the decarbonisation journey and greening the gas, the gas networks. Yeah, you've, you've anticipated my next couple of questions. Uh, from a, um, a longer term perspective, uh, can you talk a little bit about how the electricity grid here in Australia is prepared or handling the integration of intermittent uh, uh, power, uh, solar and wind in particular? I think the integration is being handled, I, don't, I guess I'd say almost as well as it could be, but the reality is this, this is a significant technical challenge. We are moving from a fleet of generators, uh, large, large, mostly coal-fired, um, and not just that they were, you know, big established with established transmission lines to them. Um, we're now starting to see um, that the more intermittent uh, generation from solar and from wind uh, as that varies, it's the, both the challenges of making sure we have enough electrons during ramp phases and that sort of thing, but also then the technical challenges, um, the, the stability, um, the system strength that a lot of the um, spinning reserve and spinning generators, old coal generators provided, uh, as that starts to exit the market, in, in making sure we still have a, a stable grid and a secure grid um, while we continue to manage more and more renewables coming online. Yeah. yeah, speaking of uh, renewables coming online, one of the uh, things I hear a lot about, a lot of discussion about is connectivity of the large solar and wind farms to the, to the grid, to the urban centres. Um, can you speak a little to that issue of uh, connectivity of the renewables to the grid? Certainly. When you think about particularly the transmission grids across the country, um, they were built usually at the same time as many of the large coal fire generators. So the Hunter Valley in New South Wales, the Latrobe Valley in Victoria, places like that uh, had strong dedicated transmission backbones uh, from those big generators to the load centres, Sydney and Melbourne and that sort of thing. 
Uh, the reality is as we move to a, a greater renewables fleet of generators, they're not going to be located in the same places. Um, so it is figuring out how we get this interaction of where are the best wind and solar resources and how that maps onto what is already there in terms of transmission infrastructure. And then what makes sense for both strengthening the grid, but also providing new, new renewable energy zones um, so we can get more of those renewable generators connecting. So that's a hugely complicated task, uh, not just the physical challenges of where the resources are and where assets may go, but then obviously the, the access issues and the who pays for various things are, are for good reason, significant policy debates and will continue to be for some time. Yeah, I was going to ask you about uh, who, who does pay for that connectivity, but I think you just kind of answered that question. Uh, but, but can you elaborate yeah, well, on that at all? Well, there's no short, yeah, there's no short answer. It, it depends on what we are doing. I mean, we have a uh, established framework of regulated networks, be they gas or, or electricity, um, and they are essentially shared infrastructure that go through a regulatory determination and customers all pay for it. And there will be cases where new infrastructure does naturally fit into that definition and should be done under, under those sort of models. But where we start to see things like renewable energy zones, they don't fit as naturally into those regulated structures, or at least certainly not up front. So it is a matter of, well, who should build what? And in, particularly in the early phases, who funds what? Um, because that potentially is a, is a different dynamic, a different financial arrangement to your your long-term, stable, low-return regulated assets. Um, and there's likely to be a role for governments, um, be a role for other support, and indeed, in some of those cases, a greater contribution from connecting generators than we've seen in the past to make sure that enabling infrastructure gets built. It'll be fun to watch uh, that and see how that develops. Uh, but moving a little bit away from uh, those issues, um, Obviously, a lot of network companies in the electricity sector are moving into non-regulated areas. Um, do you have any thoughts on that uh, issue? Um, look, if we see what's going to happen at the large scale, obviously, we've already seen huge growth in renewables, and that's uh, going to continue. The other associated bit will be the likes of batteries, pumped hydro, and, and other technologies to balance uh, the variable generation we get from wind and solar. Um, so they're li you're likely to see companies associated with networks already playing a role in that and continuing to do so. And at the household level, uh, I think the, the key theme probably in the next 10, 15, 20 years will be the rise of, if you like, the prosumer. And we'll see more and more people wanting to uh, have the smarts to take control of their energy use. Some will want to be more actively involved, but I would suspect many will want to put in the smarts in very much a set and forget sort of mind frame. So again, figuring out what in that frame is part of the regulated infrastructure, um, which is likely to be the, the physical infrastructure, the poles and wires, uh, and then other opportunities, which many aggregators and other people in the markets and likely including some affiliates of our members, uh, you'd suspect they're gonna focus on. Uh, is there any controversy around that issue? Um, well, the ring fencing issue, which is what the, you know, where we do draw the line between what is the regulated business and what, what is not, um, certainly has been controversial. Um, there's, it was brought in three or four years ago in the distribution space in the NEM. Uh, I think we would suggest uh, it is the theory, the theory of protecting customers from monopoly behaviour is very solid. Um, but I think we need to be careful that we're not protecting customers uh, from another person that can compete in a market if there isn't naturally quite effective competition developing. Um, so it's getting that balance between when, when do you need to block out the monopoly to let, to let competition go versus when is competition not going very well and customers may well be better off being either directly or partly served uh, by a monopoly provider. And I think that's a debate that's got an, an awful long way to go. Uh, household batteries, uh, I think, are a classic case for that. Uh, again, you can run a theory that they should not be network assets, and yet some of the shared benefits, some of the things we're now starting to see with our members uh, trialling batteries on pole tops and that sort of thing, um, do demonstrate that it's likely that uh, if they are at least part network assets, may well be a far better outcome for, for most consumers uh, than keeping networks out of that space. Mm, I see. So um, my final question, uh, what are some of the key initiatives for Energy Networks Australia for the next 12, 18 months? 
Um, well, unsurprisingly, from our end as the industry association, um, they will probably follow up the sort of things we've been talking about. So one of the key policy reviews underway right now from the Energy Security Board is the post-2025 review. Um, while a lot of the debate around that has been on capacity markets versus energy only markets and other frameworks, which strictly speaking is not a, not a straight network issue, there are an awful lot of things that he's touching on, um, whether we're talking about access issues of transmission, whether we're talking about how uh, solar and batteries are integrated more at the local level. So we're very heavily involved in that one. Um, we're seeing also the implementation of the National Hydrogen Strategy is something that is um, a real interest to both our gas members, but also keeping an eye more broadly on the, on the hydrogen sector. And obviously, as regulated networks sitting behind all that, um, we need a regulatory regime which investors and bankers can have confidence in and therefore can invest in these long-term assets with stable and relatively low returns. Um, so it's ensuring that the sector remains financeable uh, and looking forward to participating in uh, the ARs recently kicked off a review of inflation and we'll soon be moving into a rate of return again. And they're obviously critical reviews, critical issues both for our members and long-term interest to customers. So we'll be keeping an eye on all of them. You're going to be a busy man. Uh, Andrew, Most listen, certainly. I appreciate your time uh, this morning and um, I uh, look forward to you uh, joining us uh, once again at our live event in uh, March of next year. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, stay safe and thanks for having me. Yeah, enjoyed it and you have a good day. Bye now. Thank you.